to record, and we'll just do a little... Okay, a little sound test and everything. Yeah. One, and two, 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 one. Now I'm going to turn this on. Ooh. And that's yeah. your little recorder thingy. My little recorder thingy. Whoa. Okay, there we go. Okay, excellent. So, um, that should just pick you up really well too, actually. It's an amazing little device. Okie dokie. Um, so, I think that's good. Okay, so my name is Kiri Burke and I I'm here to be... No, oh, oh, can't, don't say anything like that. It's, it's amazing, like it just finds your face. Okay. So, the exciting thing of doing these interviews has been that sometimes the camera just stops. Stops. Well, as it <laughs> so should. So, I will, um, <clears throat> if that's the case, I will try to keep my cool and just start it again. Yeah. And we will know that we have not lost any total gems. Right. <laughs> uh, really. Okay. So, yes, Carrie. If Hi. you can begin by saying your name and where we are. And I believe it's the 12th today. Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Carrie Burke. Uh, I am a music therapist and uh, we are in my house uh, in North Vancouver. And it's on the 12th of May, uh, 2015. And uh, we're here to talk about, I believe, Valley View yeah. many years ago. But I'd like to start off a little bit earlier than that. Ooh. Um, now, actually, Carrie, you know what would be helpful? When do you need to be out the door? Uh, well, I mean, this is fairly important because history only comes by once, I think. So I've got to be well, probably me, quarter. Be yeah, yeah, I guess you'll <laughs> never get away from history. Probably qu like quarter past, quarter to seven, I would be able to get to my meeting. Okay, and you've got some Or even seven o'clock. Yeah, okay. that's right. So we've got an hour. Yeah. So um, I'm just going to be mindful of that. Okay. So, um, so what I would like to start off before we talk about Valley View, I would like to talk, to ask you about how you found music therapy. So sort of a, a kind of a background, um, you know, leading to Capilano College and just a brief sketch of your... The search for therapy. Search for music <laughs> therapy. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. So um, in uh, the 70s, uh, I was uh, becoming a musician. I was uh, studying uh, music in New York, 1970, uh, studying guitar and just wondering, you know, what I was going to do with my music. And to, to be a performer, I decided really wasn't going to work for me. The late hours, um, the uh, rubbing shoulders with the mob in New York who ran all the bars and not wanting to ask for your money because they were rough. <laughs> And uh, so I was just thinking, like, what to do? And, and I was a reflexologist. I, I worked on a farm for a while with a guy who was a reflexologist. So healing was sort of a, an interesting thing for me. And whether you could put healing together with music, there were some books out in sort of mystical uh, bo uh, bookshops about healing and music. And, and um, I just thought, well, maybe something like that might be interesting, although... Um, you know, a bit of a long shot. And so, lo and behold, after I took a year of music at, at Vancouver Community College, uh, the, the CAP program showed up, and, and here was music therapy. Not the kind of mystical music therapy that these books had sort of indicated, but more of a sort of a idea of working in ins institutions. And um, so I showed up, I think, on the first day of class, and because things were a little vacant in the numbers, uh, I got in. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how that happened. So are you a Canadian or American? Yes, I'm a Canadian. I was born in, in Vancouver, but I, I did live in New York when I was young, and I, I lived there again and you were, for a bit. And you were born in what year? Uh, 53. 1953. So you basically, you had your high school. Did you do post-secondary before? Uh, yeah, I had a, I've had an odd life. Okay, so I lived here. Then we moved to Ottawa, then to New York, then to London, uh, then to Paris, then to London, then to Toronto. And so I did a bit of high school in England, a bit of high school in Toronto. Um, 
and then I did a year of community college at VCC and then a couple of years at, uh, at CAP that was a, a college at the time and then I did uh, another year to get my my degree with uh, Antioch in Yellow Springs but it was a distance thing so I got a degree in music in music therapy um, through Yellow Springs okay okay so so you showed up at Capilano College mm -hmm. and got into the program and how many guys were there I think there were like three, three other guys, four altogether. Out of? Out of about 20 to, to, to start. So not that many guys. Okay. And Liz can tell me her, her side of the story. Yeah. But, um, so what was the program like? What kind of books did you read? What kind of theories were you guys uh, Oh, seeing? well, um, first of all, there weren't too many books. Uh, music therapy was pretty much brand new. I think the library had you know, maybe four or five books on music therapy at the time. And um, basically the, the two people in charge of the program, Nancy McMaster and Carolyn Kenny, were influenced by uh, the English approach, um, which was a psychotherapeutic approach, Nordoff and Robbins. And uh, Carolyn was uh, kind of a mystical person herself, so it had a bit of a mystical element to it and of course it had a psychological grounding in terms of co the college and so forth so it was a uh, trying to be mystical trying to be psychotherapeutic and trying to be um, kind of humanistic all at the same time which was a, a bit of a difficult thing and it was the first year so things were very bumpy for actually many years at the college just to get the resources, to get the practicums, to get people in, employed. I think when we started there were maybe three people working in music therapy in Vancouver, which is not very many, so there was very little acceptance of, of music therapy, very little knowledge of music therapy. And um, we were the, the beginning of all of that. Pioneers. We were pioneers and we didn't even know it. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, just, just because I'm curious that there were about three people doing music therapy in Vancouver. Do you know where they were doing that? Uh, well, Carolyn and Nancy had, uh, uh, they had a program, they had a grant that they were doing, the Spontaneous Music Workshop. <laughs> Uh, and they would go into Woodlands and a few other big institutions and do improvised music with a group of other people. And um, so that was one kind of really off-the-wall music therapy. Uh, and then there was somebody working at um, uh, the deaf school. Off. It's tricky, isn't it? it yeah, is. it is. Yeah. You I could come I and sit with me. You know what? Take pause. Um, Susan Wu was at Riverview and Karen Crockford was at... Was you know what? You're on a time limit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can get Why that from Liz. Why don't I give you a piece of paper oh. and a pen, and you can just jot things down, and we'll cover it. Oh. Mm -hmm. Because was Susan I'm, already I'm there? just sensitive to the time constraints, and I think that Karen's thing is going to be... Yep. Valid. He's got other things to okay. say. Okay. Yeah. So where did you do your placement? Oh, let's see. The one that I remember the most was out at uh, a children's center out at UBC. And uh, mostly autistic kids out there. And um, that was, I now work with children a lot, so I think that was probably uh, my big thing. Oops. That's okay. You yeah. can't do anything about the phone. Well, we can take it off. And then, you, know, you have to find the thing. Yeah, I know. Only one of them is, is can much find. charged. Yeah. I can tell you right now at home, there's no charge on any of the phones. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there you so, go. So, um, okay, I want to I wanna just uh, ask you, so you worked with children, you work with children now. Was working with children the goal? How did you envision yourself out as a music therapist? Oh, well, because it was so new, 
Actually, th there was no plan. I don't think anybody thought they were going to get a job. It really was a, a program to explore music therapy. And so in you know, the absence of books, really, we did a great deal of, of musical improvisation with sort of a psychotherapeutic bent and experimented on on each other really and so there were you know various techniques that we learned and went out into the field to sort of try but it was all um pretty slapdash and we were we were experimenting a great deal so there was not much in the way of this was going to lead to a job it was more of a sort of a process you were going to spend an interesting couple of years in the program learning about music and learning about yourself and learning about how you could apply this stuff but whether that would ever come about um, was not i think and it was in general in in those days there wasn't this career orientation that we, that we have today <laughs> i was gonna say it's very 70s i mean actually, it, it really was well it is but i mean anyways as yeah. a parent of young adults i just think oh come on why does it have to be so serious all the time? Like, things are going to work out. Yeah. Um, you know what? Because you come from a media background, you will know that I may just not respond for a minute to let the film, so for editing purposes. Oh, sure. You know? Yeah, if you it's have a not certain, that you're... If you have a sense that when you kind of wrapped up a topic, if you could just take a second, I'd... Oh, if you remember okay. that, but okay. if you don't, sure, I sure, forget sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so how did you end up at Valley View? Tell me the story of how you ended up at Valley View. Okay, so um, when I graduated from, from CAP, I started uh, working towards my degree at Antioch. I started working with children, and one day I got a phone call from Doreen Alexander saying that there was a job opening up, a part-time job at Valley View, and would I be interested in, uh, in applying? And so I did. I went out there and, and took a look, and working in a big hospital was not kind of a, a thing I thought I would really enjoy, but um, gave it a whirl, met Moira, and uh, she was just a powerhouse and uh, was really wanting to change that institution and kind of go boldly where nobody had gone before uh, in terms of uh, the seniors there. So that's that's how that happened. And when was that? I've been trying to remember. I think that was about 1980, possibly 81. Um, and uh, I think I probably worked there for about two and a half years. Um, got a helicopter going over. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, this part, this part's just, this is how I wrap. Oh, okay. For me, this is just yeah. Oh, okay, gaps. good. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I worked there for about t two and a half years. Uh, Doreen was there, then I joined, and then we had like three or four other people come on staff, and Moira was, was just an absolute powerhouse wanting to develop a team uh, and to really change the way people saw working with uh, seniors with dementia. When we started, they all had uh, pre-senile dementia, and when we left, they all had Alzheimer's, and uh, they all got re-diagnosed. <laughs> Maples. Yeah. So, so I, of course, I want to hear more about about Moira and what she did. But can you tell me a, a bit about what Valley View was like, like kind of the physical, like what you remember about the physical setting, the buildings. Sure. Um, Valley View Hospital is on the, the grounds of Riverview, the big mental hospital. Uh, the big mental hospital is largely big old brick buildings. Um, Valley View is a big concrete building, so it's kind of the newer building. I think it was green, lime green. Um, four floors. Uh, the top three floors uh, had people in, in beds, pretty much comatose ward after ward and then on the um, on the ground floor there was the rehab area when we started the rehab area was one of those older ones with woodworking and so forth um, and real old timers who had been there all, a long time 
the, the level of patience, what they could do, had dropped so that there had been a lot of woodworking and arts and crafts and stuff, and people were no longer able to do that kind of stuff, which was partly why Moira was putting together something different that would be, work for people who were not as capable. There were outbuildings as a part of Valley View. Um, I think there were four of them. Um, so wards that you had to walk to that were close by. Uh, <clears throat> they were kind of scary. They were real old, older style concrete buildings and they, they had a sort of a close feeling. The grounds were unbelievably beautiful, strange, uh, older trees, you know, like a, almost like a garden of trees. And um, what I'll never forget is uh, some of the trees are trees that are upside down, so they got the roots in the air and they look kind of tortured. And in a place with mental issues, uh, to have these particular trees kind of all over the place seemed like uh, a bit of a mistake. <laughs> You know, it was the botanical gardens. Yeah. 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 It was the first provincial botanical gardens. Ah, there gardens. you and go. And moved it out to UBC. Mm. So that's the Ah, oh, oh there we go. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, sometimes... <laughs> I've learned something. Historians are sometimes... Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, no, no. Um, so, so you've described the environment. Um, what about the patients? Uh... Wow, what about the patients? So the patients are, are seniors. Uh, they were uh, generally people who had become violent in whatever re residential care situation they were, become unmanageable, and so they would come to Valley View uh, where the staffing ratios were much higher uh, and the staff better trained for the more violent people. Um, they often um, were not violent at Valley View, um, just with a change and, and with different staff. They often took them off the meds and sort of redid the, uh, the medications that they were on. So um, generally speaking, they were really wonderful people, um, you know, so long as the families weren't around because they often didn't know who the families were as people with dementia are. So. They're almost like Buddhists, I used to think, people in the here and now, uh, able to, you know, really make their way in this moment quite nicely. But, you know, the past, not so easy. The distant past, a little bit better. And then <clears throat> where it become emotionally hard was when the families would come around. They wouldn't recognize the kids and stuff. So were they, um, did you get an impression, I, I don't, I don't expect you to come up with numbers, but of uh, exact numbers. But what about the gender breakdown? Uh, oh, many more women than than men. Um, there were people with um, ment not not sort of senility issues, but with mental issues. So you know, schizophrenia and paranoid delusions and so forth, who came over from Riverview because they were old. But generally speaking, they were people who wound up with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. I think to begin with it was called pre-senile dementia and these wards uh, above the ground floor in the main building with uh, just people in a comatose type state were all pre-senile dementia. Very odd places. So do you, and most of them, you, your memory is that most of them had families? Uh, yeah, I mean, the the ones that had the emotional impact were the ones who had families. There was plenty that, you know, might have families, but, but you never saw them. Um, and then quite a few obviously didn't have family members. And So did you work with a select, was there some sort of sorting thing about which patients you worked with? Uh, the... The way it worked was uh, you'd be assigned to some of the wards um, uh, to begin with when there were two of us, 50-50, and you could do very little. As the numbers grew, you would be able to work more with you know people on a particular ward. 
Um, there were team meetings, uh, which were very new at the time. I think when I showed up uh, a year or so before, there were doctors and nurses and social workers. And that was it. And the nurses had done a lot of the sort of arts and crafts, some of them. And there was a, kind of a bad feeling about bringing in Moira and the specialists who had not existed before. And then to bring them into the, the hospital, they had created uh, treatment teams on each of the wards. And so we spent a lot of time going to meetings, actually. And at the meetings, there would be plans for each person. And if they had had certain things in their past about music, or if they were hard. <laughs> well, it is a nice thing it's about interviewing you guys. You're, everybody's very supportive of the screw up. So yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. Why this is happening. Um, don't so worry. No That was does. a lovely part because you were describing the, the types of patients you worked with. And right. I'm just wondering if you can just give a little intro to that. And okay. Then give me that because that was the ones they go to a meeting and which ones do you okay. in the sorting yeah. process? Okay, yeah. The sorting process? Yeah. 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 So um, I think Moira's brief was to create treatment teams and to bring onto these teams that, that um, would be treating and sorting the patients, um, you know, the physios, the music therapists, the art therapist. Um, and uh, so um, for music therapy, often they would be people who had had contact with music in the past maybe they were a violinist, or people who were um, not really amenable to talking, um, or people who were violent, actually. We would often work with people like that to give them a sort of a, a, a means of expression other than violence. Hmm. Um, and did you work with depressed patients? I think um, not per se. I think that, that uh, there were a lot of people who were depressed, but we were working with with people with with more. There were there were people who were suffering from, still from shell shock. The vets, um, people who were you know quite aggressive, um, and we were more working with with people like that. People who are not able to talk and so forth. So if you can't talk, it's a little hard to know if you're depressed or not. Um, I just want to backtrack because you said something really interesting a couple of minutes ago, and that was you said that the the patients used to be able to do woodwork and used to be able to do I don't know basket making and that sort yes. of stuff. And there was this older rehab staff. Yes. And who were being replaced by new activities, new staff. Can you give me an idea of why the patients were? more physically incapacitated, or what, why the change, and who were the old people, the old... Older staff. staff? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, when I showed up, the, the, the hospital complex was going through a tremendous change, and Moira was a big part of that change. She had been brought in to bring in new kinds of treatment. And part of the reason for that was that the old kind of treatment wasn't working. And so originally there were doctors and nurses and these rehab staff were old, old guys who had done uh, woodworking and crafts uh, for, for many years and, and nurses who had done crafts and so forth. And um, I remember them telling me that, that there just weren't as many people able to do woodworking as had been the case before and to be frank I don't know exactly why that is but m my understanding is that the numbers of people with severe disturbances who required being shunted from the home that they were in to Valley View was uh, exponentially increasing and that they were having a lot of trouble with essentially more seniors with bigger problems who, when they arrived at Valley View, were um, further along in the dementia process. And so the kinds of 
woodworking stuff wasn't working. That was my understanding. I never had a, a talk with anybody about it. I mean, I would guess that the women didn't do the woodworking. And your impression is of a lot of women. Yes. But, um, but those are older ideas. And yes. Ideas about therapy yes. were really ch uh, changing the mental health at that time. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So how much of your training from CAP were you able to implement it at value. Oh, a lot of it. It was, uh, it was really handy. <laughs> um, you know, in order to, um, to work in that particular system, you needed to do assessments. You needed to do a great number of reports that was very Byzantine as to how it was being set up and, and, and how you could try and be accountable to a lot of other people in groups and trying to keep track of where the patients were and how they were progressing and if they were progressing. So when it came to the actual treatment, uh, in order to deal with a new patient, somebody who uh, you had not met before, um, you really had to come up with something that they would respond to in terms of the music. and. To be frank, it was pretty much always guesswork. You didn't know um, if somebody, for instance, had uh, been a violin player and they were being referred because they had... Just don't, don't worry, just... Okay. You know, if you give it a good slap sometimes... <laughs> don't worry, you're with a bunch of technology haters. <laughs> Only when it works well, then it's easy. But um, so if I had a new patient who, for instance, had been a violin player um, and, say, was no longer able to play the violin, uh, he may not want anything to do with a music at all because it reminds him of lost ability. He may not want to use simple instruments uh, because it is something that is reminding him of uh, stuff that happened before. Or he may just love the opportunity to play simple instruments and to find expression in that. Look for points of contact, things that they really loved, um, and then work from there. Okay, now it's working. Late, I just changed the cards. Okay. It was all around when Maddie was born. Mm -hmm. He was born in 79. You were at Ruth at Valley View. Okay, it seems to be working. Which thing is this? Okay, so this is the end. Okay. You're really good at that. You're better than I am. You need a techy person to come along with you, don't you? I know, I had a boy once before. Yeah. There are people who get it. They, but they're all the, they get their it. youth. I know, and they do they're make you realize check, that they you. Don't care about anything else. <laughs> oh no, he's he's been great. Oh, he has been wonderful that guy. But I just couldn't bring him out to BC, and I didn't know like you know. Anyways, I didn't know anyone here, and I just felt uncomfortable. Okay, so like I'm just gonna assume that this is all perfect. We're not gonna do yeah. that. Good. And I'm gonna ask you to tell me about Mora. Okie dokie. I want you to just tell me what she was like. And okay. Just her, her vision, just whatever you want to say about Moira. Okay. <laughs> All right, Moira. Moira was big. She was a large personality. And she was on a mission. And um, my understanding of Moira over the years was that she had worked previously with children and had steered children's treatment, and I don't know where, in a similar process where there was not very many diagnoses and there was a lot of kids all thrown into the same thing. And then when they sort of came out of that, there was all the differences that we see today. And she was wanting to do the same thing and be part of that same process uh, with seniors. And so that was kind of happening so that the treatment teams uh, and the, the number of diagnoses and the differences were all, um, as she said one day, she said, if you don't have the right diagnosis, you cannot have a good outcome. 
and uh, you know you can't really argue with that. She was, uh, in addition to being, a, you know, a person with a mission, she was also uh, just a powerhouse for institutional um, building, changing. She was brought in to put in a very large change. Uh, my understanding was that there was just doctors and, and, and nurses, a couple of aides running the shop, the, the woodworking shop. And she was going to bring in uh, occupational therapists and physiotherapists and the music therapists, and that those people were going to go out into the teams. They were going to form teams, and they were going to revolutionize the hospital. The hospital, especially the doctors and the nurses, didn't really think that was necessarily a good idea. But they had been ordered by the uh, the head of the hospital to comply and so uh, there was a, a lot of very ferocious back and forth about turf and uh, whether rehab people were welcome, whether they could do anything. Um, almost the first day on the job for me, uh, I was asked to go to the fourth ward and withdraw the services of the rehab. Which, being new, I assume maybe we do that all the time. And so they invited me into the meeting and, and they said, is there anything you'd like to say? And so I said, yes, I'm, Moyer said, well, we're withdrawing the services. And there was this look of absolute hatred from all these 20 people in the room. <laughs> and I realized that there was more to this than I knew. And uh, it was a maneuver that she was doing for some particular purpose, that uh, hardball, we call that, institutional hardball. And um, she lived by the sword. She died by the sword. They eventually got rid of her from Valley View. She went into private practice. But while she was there, she was um, one of the more supportive bosses I've ever had. Any idea that I had for something that we should try, um, in general, she was for. She was totally open to that, which, you know, is just a, a lovely idea. And uh, probably, probably she, she just left a, a great legacy there, I would say. So, I'm going to just, I'm just going to grab these little, um, I've just got little headphones. I'm getting slightly. Um, What's that? So, the film. Do you know about the film? I do know about the film. I want to get the film. I, I hopefully will get the film. I'm not a Moira, but I can be stubborn. And I'm hoping <laughs> yeah. to get the film. We've got a copy. Uh, we I used to have. Um, yeah. So, oh, I don't think I can do that. With this. But I'm just convinced that you are being recorded, and I'm not going to worry. Um, so, so Moira comes in, she has, so tell me a little bit more. So you said one of the parts of her vision is, is that diagnosis equals appropriate treatment. But what, what is that about in terms of patient professional? What's it about in terms of, what's the Moira model in terms of professional professional? I'm not sure what you're saying there. So, how is Moira's vision of treatment different than the psych nurse at Riverview's vision of treatment? Uh, uh, well, I guess for, for what Moira was putting in with her treatment team was that people uh, who uh, had become disoriented uh, at a other facility were going to come in, they were going to be assessed, they were going to be treated, um, and in that treatment a large part of it would be medication, uh, and a significant amount would be in her rehab department. And so um, 
that force of rehab would be a large part of those people's treatment and then they would be sent back to wherever it was that they had come from, that there was a fair amount of that going on. That was sort of the, what was coming up and of course these four floors above or three floors above with people who had basically not been treated and that's how they were winding up. And you don't see that anymore. So in a certain sense, that's kind of the result of that that idea, I think, is a more active treatment. You don't wind up comatose in a bed. You, you're, you're active. So activation is uh, perhaps what her, her thought was on that. And multifaceted. So art and physical, music, pretty much anything that people would respond to. Uh, so that they would get out of there again and go back to wherever it was they came from. That was a nice band. So, so the, did you find it stimulating working with people from different professional groups? And different yeah, groups? I mean, it was fantastic. It was, um, you know, we were young, we were idealistic, we'd been brought in as a part of her mission and uh, we were changing this hospital and uh, you know parts of it were were resisted very very much by the by the hospital and uh, other parts were bought into by the hospital and I think by the time uh, I left a couple of years later uh, it was well established for the most part um, that treatment was going to be a multifaceted thing and I think it's remained that way in many hospitals so this was a, a thing that's gone on all over the place but uh, certainly in that case it was Moira dragging these people kicking and screaming. So can you give me <laughs> can you give me a dragging kicking and screaming story or a resistance story? Uh, well I think that that first one where she um, had not been given access to patients on this ward and she decided to withdraw the service would be a perfect example. And I didn't realize she was dragging these people, kicking and screaming until I saw their faces and it was as if I had hit them. They had not been cooperating with her when she withdrew the services they turned around and wanted access to the service again. So that's a pretty good example of hardball. Yeah. And what about an example of buy-in? Uh, probably the, the craziest program we ran there was a, was a sing-along. I did it with Kay Thompson and, well, Doreen to begin with, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, Kay Thompson. And um, so it began as about, 10 people uh, and uh, sing-along is nice and popular. It's a thing from years ago as well. They would always do sing-alongs in big institutions. So the, there was a buy-in from the nurses about that and from the doctors. So uh, we would get referrals for this particular program. I think it got up to about 60 uh, and involved the bus and it involved setting up a great big room full of people and so we would go in this bus it was kind of like a little magic bus through all the wards picking up the patients and it became a centerpiece really for the whole hospital for the nurses to get their their people there and for the nurses to get people ready for rehab so they had to get out of the ward walk to rehab there was often a bit of a battle for that. Um, the nurses felt that, you know, they didn't want any more work and they had enough work and da, 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 was it really worth it? In this one regard, um, they were just really wanting to send these people and then to have other people go along. So there was tremendous buy-in for that particular program. I can see why that would be um, a bind. So you're saying it was sort of an, something they already did, but you just kind of worked with it a bit. Well, I think it was, I don't know that they actually did it there. 
I, I don't know that in the past they had done that, they, other than hymns at a service or something like that. The woodworking and the crafts, I never heard of anyone doing the singing, but over at, at Riverview they had somebody who was doing music and music therapy um, and was running a similar kind of a program. So it's, it's just a, an obvious one. The other one for buy-in is, um, and this is just a thing for myself, I would often offer to work with people who were difficult to work with. Back in those days, uh, there wasn't chemical containment um, the way there is today, so that we would have people who would scream endlessly, um, sometimes for weeks. And I would offer to work with those people. And um, I have to say, with a little bit of success from time to time, but mostly it, the offer to help nurses with what is a ghastly, horrible situation was deeply appreciated by the staff. In that case, we were helping them with a problem that was almost beyond enduring. So just knowing that there was somebody trying to help them, they, they loved that. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, so you're per giving me quite a kind of nuanced picture of recreational therapy versus um, the nursing medical model, mm -hmm. you know, and um, what I get from what you're saying is that, you know, the, the meds were there, but you were saying here's an alternative to medication. Yes. The, they're going to have both. Well, yeah, so the teams w would have a psychiatrist, often a doctor, nurses, the charge nurse, and uh, representatives from the, the, uh, the um, rehab department. So the treatment plans would involve, quote unquote, the whole person. So there would be, you know, the person's body, but also you'd need something for their mind and for their feelings and so forth. So the medications were not as sophisticated as they are today. So as somebody in the, who's screaming all the time, you don't see them anymore. They are chemically restrained. Back then, it was a lot bumpier, and so there was more sort of searching for what can we do for any of these people in some cases. Did you work with a chaplain? Yeah. So tell me about, because I thought that was interesting that the chaplain was part of Moira's team, or I get, gather he was. Was that he, right? Um, okay, was he? Yes, he was. Uh, was that odd? Yeah, I guess it was. <laughs> Uh, I think that's one of those political things. Uh, I don't remember his name. Glenn. Glenn, Glenn uh, Watts. Glenn Watts. Um, uh, yeah, so he would go sometimes to the team meetings and uh, he would have his uh, services. And uh, I have to say, I'll never forget him trying to do sermons to the confused. <laughs> It was one of those glorious moments where you just felt so sorry for him. On the other hand, uh, he would come into some of my programs sometimes and, uh, and sing some hymns and, uh, and, and make a sort of a spiritual contact with the people that he was trying to reach. And th that was just glorious. That uh, made a whole different kind of a program. And, um, and he, he loved working with other people because the straight ahead sort of chaplain approach with confused elderly wasn't going to work for him in, you know, 80% of the, 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 the patients. So he was looking for other ways he found them. And did you work with physio? Because physio and music therapy, like you're both in the therapy zone, but you're kind of here and here, right? Right. Uh, we would do uh, some walking programs with the physios, so also with the nurses, actually. Um, so they would be walking some of the patients and uh, 
Liz can talk about that in a bit because she was doing some of them too. And we would be using uh, the rhythm of music in order to support people's walking. There never was uh, as much of that as as I would have liked, but uh, sometimes with the physios they would find that useful to extend people's uh, focus on what they were doing if there was uh, uh, some music associated with that. So you took them outside in the ground? Uh, no, actually up and down the corridors. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was an inside thing. Yeah. Did you ever do um, community institution stuff, like either taking patients out into the community or people from the community coming into the institution? Uh, I didn't. Uh, I believe th there was a, a, a volunteer coordinator who did like a lot of sort of bringing in groups and so forth, so I myself didn't do that. Uh, and I didn't on the b behalf of uh, Valley View, I did a few um, workshops. There was a sort of a gerontology association and Moira had a big piece to do with with that on a number of occasions. And uh, we would have um, I guess like a couple of hundred people doing music therapy activities as a part of that that um, workshop, as a part of that conference for a few years. And uh, probably my favorite part of that was uh, the, the boss of the hospital got to play a big gong I've got downstairs and uh, as a part of this improvisation. And uh, he said afterwards it was the only time in his years of being the boss there that he sort of turned around and everybody was watching him. And he said, it was the only time I really felt like I was running the place because there was everybody watching me and there was no problems <laughs> and it was good. Everybody was happy. <laughs> so, so Moira did the, uh, like a professional conference on the grounds of Riverview? No, it was the Gerontology Association, so it's a province-wide thing, right. and she was doing a part on the Valley View rehab model. And as a part of that, I was doing a music part, and then the, there were some other parts that she was doing that. And then there would be other things going on. From, it's, recording. it's good that it clicks. <laughs> you weren't saying anything, you were just saying No. Yes. So, so she, I, I find it, I mean, she's a real go-getter, huh? Cause Huge go-getter. Huge. She must have published them. She, she uh, uh, yeah, yeah, we did a study, Moira and I, uh, counting violent incidents on the ward one time. Um, that was great. I think it's the only thing I've published it in that regard. So she pushed people she wanted. She must have done stuff previous too with the uh, with the children stuff because she had spent years doing that. So she was a promoter? She was a big time promoter. Mm -hmm. I mean she was a political animal. So you know running the, the hospital and getting her slice of the pie was uh, her, she loved it. Drove yeah. her crazy. Okay. We've, got, we've got about seven minutes. Um, so you've already talked a bit about her as a like. Was she a mentor? Not particularly. Um, she was. Um, you know, number one, she was super busy. She just had a million things going on. So. I was somewhat wary of her because she could really run people over, you know, if she didn't like you, um, you didn't last long, let's put it that way. And although she liked me a lot, um, you know, it was uh, uh, somewhat nerve-wracking being in that, being too close to her, I found, so I kept a bit of distance. She, I think she was quite supportive of, of women. She, or she could be. Yeah. I think if you were on her A-list, you yeah. were so... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I think... Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah. No, she was, for, for, for trying to get people to do stuff, she was wonderful. She wanted me to, when she left, she wanted me to go with her and, uh, and to her next adventure and stuff, and I didn't want to, to do that, but uh, she had all kinds of adventures afterwards. Did you shift to full time there? No, I wound up going to the college. Right, right. Working there. So, um, so I, I, I think that the last thing that I really, the, the last kind of pieces that I've got about, um, about, um, are really just to ask about the potential of music therapy and the approach that was used. So, you know, you worked at Valley View for a few years and you were involved in this pioneering moment. And um, what would you say were kind of like, if you, you know, to, to speak to people who are in the field today in geriatric mental health, um, what, what do you think that, you know, to speak as sort of the voice to, of a historical moment. From the past? <laughs> <laughs> you I'm don't sorry. know what it was I'm like. Really, you don't know. Give me my oxygen cylinder. <laughs> okay, we had, uh, uh, we kind of set up a thing in a way and I was a part of the setting up of that, that is, um, that's lasted, you know, so all these years later, people are working on teams and there are music therapists in a lot of the institutions here in, in BC and, uh, and they're doing, you know, pretty similar things to what we were doing, partly because there's only certain kinds of things that seniors are going to respond to and the you know the, the the songs that you're going to sing are going to be different the instrumental stuff you do is is going to be the same so it's it really it sort of feels like a job well done back then and uh, it was it was a lot of fun and and you see that it's it's kind of continued uh, in a certain way um, you wonder what's going to happen in the future with all the funding, you know, problems and, and restraints and stuff coming along. But um, in that time, something really creative happened and was fostered from the top, which is relatively unusual. And um, I'm super glad I had a chance to do that. Yeah, that was, I mean, it was a really, you know, that was when Leah Rosling told me this was the best moment of my life as a mus music therapist. Yeah. That's when I thought, so what was happening at Valley View that was so cool? Yeah. But you know what I think is that you guys went ahead like 10 steps. And then since then, there haven't been 10 more steps, right? I suppose so. I suppose so. I mean, it gets pretty tricky, like, uh, you know, do you want seniors to be in institutions? Do you want them to be at home? Um, you know, there's there's a lot more effort now to keep people in homes and away from that, that sort of institutional situation. So in, in another way, kind of, it was a thing that uh, before a lot of these people with Alzheimer's would wind up in these upper floors comatose and today they're sitting in their homes uh, struggling but they're in their homes and they're 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 in a very different situation so in that regard um, I do s sometimes work in a couple of facilities on the North Shore here and the environment that your your person with Alzheimer's is in today is uh, absolutely fantastic. It's very different from from back there. So there has been continuing changes, a lot of them in the medications, I have to say. Um, 
and also in the training of the, the staff, in, especially in the aides. The aides were not well trained back then, and that became a, an issue, and it, it's been addressed beautifully, and aides these days are just the most incredibly warm and friendly, loving people. Uh, and my dad is now in a, in a facility. And the aides are just a, an absolute, they're angels to him. They're just always positive and wonderful. And that's a fantastic change that has continued past the, the, uh, the time that we were there. So if you could use one word to kind of encapsulate or a couple of words to kind of encapsulate that change in, I mean, it's really in, you're talking about attitudes towards patients, right? Yes. Towards elderly yeah. patients with dementia or something. Yeah. So what's, the, what's that? Well, I would say that um, uh, the treatment that, that my dad is getting is really loving. <clears throat> And way back when, it was pretty harsh when we started at Valley View. The doctors, nurses, um, it was a pretty, pretty harsh, restrained kind of a thing. Uh, and I think all the love today that my dad's getting is, uh, is much better than what was going on back there. And do you think that the creative arts therapies that you were bringing, do you think it was a bit of a step in that direction? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the things that Moyer said, we, were, we went through, I think, in the two and a half years I was there, probably maybe two strikes. Uh, and uh, Moira would say, you've got to get yourselves uh, declared an essential service because uh, in a closed down ward where there's nothing going on, what do you need? What is the essential service? It's somebody to activate as opposed to somebody to look after that person and that looking after is what resulted in all the people upstairs not moving. And it was hard to, to think that at the time because if it's life and death, do you want a nurse or do you want a music therapist? And she would say, no, it's the music therapist. You want, a, you want somebody who's going to make life happen as opposed to care that. Just take care of the basic physical needs. So it's an, an interesting thing. And what my dad's getting is both. He's getting a great treatment for his body and his mind. And he's getting a great emotional experience, too. And that's pretty neat. Pretty yeah. Amazing. It is. Facility, yeah. It? it really is. Yeah. It's really yeah. 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 It's, great. it's gotta be other places that thank God he's not there, but I don't know. I mean yeah, yeah. And we were really lucky to be able to keep our mom my mom got to stay at home. Mm. Uh, it was really big for her. Yeah. But you know, we were we were lucky in many things to be able yeah. to pull that off. Yeah, well, Liz nursed her mom downstairs unto yeah. yeah. death. You know, Carrie, I was also just thinking, uh, I don't know if this is something you would, would want to say more about. I think part of what Moira was about is that she she educated us all about um, dementia. And oh, I would love to hear either one of you speak to that because... You know, this is really early days it for is. dementia. We didn't know. And I think some of the treatment that people were getting were kind of like behaviors, like, like oh, you're being bad, you know, so you're going to get punished for these behaviors. Whereas Moira came in and she just said, look, folks, you haven't a clue what dementia is about, what it's doing to the brain. I mean, in those days, they couldn't even say for sure if it was Alzheimer's or not. You know, it yeah. had to be... Yeah, well, the Alzheimer's came in. Okay, I want to talk about that for a sec? Yeah, well, I'm, I should point out to you that it's about 12 minutes to 7. Okay. So, Ross is, Ross so waiting for you. Liz can, yeah, I know. Liz can speak Yeah, okay. To that. If you, you know. Yeah. yeah okay. There we are. 
great man. That was oh, that was lovely. Okay. That was really good. good. And I, I don't Thanks really understand. Me into history. Oh, <laughs> I hope you don't feel too anxious. No matter what. <laughs> we're, we're, we're Listen, do you want to take some uh, food with more? Do you know?